we really turn to Carolyn Cox, who for years worked at the Northwest Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides as their scientist, staff scientist, and was the editor of the Journal of Pesticide Reform, and now is the uh, senior scientist at Center for Environmental Health in Oakland, California. But this session has grown to be important to everyone, regardless of your background and how much you know. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Carolyn, and wel welcome everybody. You'll get a more formal welcome uh, later on this evening, um, but consider yourself the special group of people that get to meet one-on-one -on -one with Carolyn. So. Yeah. And this is the 33rd National Pesticide Forum. So Jay and all the staff at Beyond Pesticides deserves an incredible round of applause for making that happen for 33 years. It's amazing. You know when they said, like, don't trust anybody over 30? <laughs> Here we are. Okay, so my name's Carolyn Cox. I'm with the Center for Environmental Health in California, and I'm here to talk about 10 reasons not to use pesticides. And it's kind of a gimmick. Um, I don't think anybody here is planning on using pesticides anyway, but it's a way to just go through sort of the basic problems with pesticides. Um, and for all those of you who have heard me give this talk, you know, 10 times before, I um, appreciate your uh, willingness to hear it again. And I, I do try to put in a few new tidbits every year so you won't have to sleep through the whole thing. Um, can you go to the next slide? So here's the first of my 10 reasons. Pesticides don't solve pest problems. You might be scratching your head a little bit and go, isn't that what pesticides are supposed to do? Well, pesticides are very special chemicals and they are designed to kill or harm living things. But that doesn't mean that they solve pest problems. The way you actually solve a pest problem is by um, answering the question, what is it that allows this pest to thrive? And then doing something about that so the pest doesn't thrive. Just killing a pest is usually a recipe for more pests. I mean, think about your garden. You go pull a weed, right? What's the first thing that comes back? Another weed. I mean, that's sort of the, the pest treadmill, if you will. Um, can you go to the next slide? So um, one of the ways I like to, quote, prove that pesticides don't solve pest problems is to look at how much pesticides we're using. Now, we've been using pesticides for a long time. Um, if they actually solve pest problems, we probably wouldn't be having to use very much, right? Because we would have solved all the problems, and it'd be history. Well, if you look at pesticide use, it has gone down just a little tiny bit in the last few decades, but not really very much. In terms of sort of conventional pesticides, there's more than a billion pounds a year used in the U.S., and it's been that way for decades. So now I'm just going to run through quickly some slides that talk about how do you actually solve a pest problem. So um, let's start with your house. Um, the first thing is just to keep pests out, right? There's lots of pests that are fine when they're out in the big wide world, but a problem when they're in your kitchen. So screens and caulk. Um, doors, um, and especially tight-fitting doors are really important. Um, escutcheons, which are um, things that fit around plumbing pipes, so pests don't use those as a highway. Um, making sure that your that pests don't have something to eat. So um, keeping food in jars that uh, ants or pantry moths can't get into. Um, not leaving pet food around as a you know buffet bar for whoever might want to show up. Um, water is important to allow pests to thrive. So things like your bathroom fan and fixing leaky plumbing are really important in terms of not allowing pests to thrive. And all of those things actually solve your pest problem as opposed to just putting you on the treadmill. 
Um, one more. Um, so sometimes you just need to clean more thoroughly than you would do um, anyway. So vacuuming, scrubbing are really helpful. Um, so what about on the farm, on our food? Well, it's the same concept. You look at what, what allows pests to thrive and what can we do about it. Those of you who are on the tour today saw a great example at Uncle Matt's. Um, but beneficial insects, insects that eat pest insects, are really helpful. Um, compost to build healthy soil. That was the whole um, essence of what Uncle Matt's is doing, is keeping his citrus healthy by um, creating a healthy soil. Um, sometimes there are varieties that have fewer pest problems, so you can grow those. Varieties that are well adapted to your particular climate are really important. Um, green manure crops are a good way of building healthy soil. And um, growing a diversity of crops, so um, it's not just a monoculture of one thing, is also really helpful. Okay, next. So we're on to reason number two. The second reason not to use pesticides is that this is no surprise to anybody here, right? Pesticides are in fact hazardous to our health. They're designed to be hazardous to somebody's health um, and we're just all too much alike. So, um, so even EPA, who we here in this room often bicker with, um, actually agrees. And here's a long list of problems that EPA says are caused by exposure to pesticides. Um, so what I was going to do to illustrate health hazards of pesticides is just go through um, three really commonly used pesticides just as examples. So um, what I'm going to do is the most common herbicide, which is also the most commonly used pesticide altogether, the most common insecticide, and the most common fungicide. So the most common herbicide is glyphosate, you probably know it as Roundup, um, 190 million pounds per year. That was a 2006 estimate, and I know it's way more than that now. Um, so um, what does the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health say about glyphosate? They say it's a mutagen. That means it damages our genes, and it's a reproductive effector. That means it causes birth defects and similar problems. Um, and hot off the press a few weeks ago, oh, um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer says glyphosate causes cancer. Um, so uh, next. So chlorpyrifos is um, the most commonly used insecticide or was in 2006. Um, EPA hasn't updated their estimates of pesticide use in a long time, almost 10 years. Um, so at that time, they estimated 11 million pounds per year. Um, again, what does NIOSH say about it? They say um, it's a mutagen, it damages our genes, reproductive effector, um, affects the development of the nervous system in um, uh, babies. And um, Next. Um, chlorthalonil is the most commonly used fungicide. Um, that was mentioned on the tour today, if you remember. So estimated use, again, 10 years old, um, 9 million pounds per year. Um, so what does NIOSH say about chlorthalonil? Again, it damages our genes. Again, it's a reproductive effector. Actually affects our ability to have children. And um, it's what NIOSH would call a tumorigen, it causes cancer. Um, so um, those are just the top three. We could go you know, down the list and do this more and more and more, but um, I think that's enough examples. So reason number three, um, pesticides cause special problems for children. Um, this is kind of intuitive, but if you need something to back up your intuition, next. Um, so one thing is that kids, for their size, drink more water and eat more food than 
adults do. So if there are pesticides in the food or the water, kids will get more than adults. Um, they also play in ways that expose them to pesticides. So if you've ever watched a kid, you know, rolling around on the carpet or um, playing on the lawn or putting something in their mouth, you know that um, if any of those things have pesticides on them, they're going to ingest more than you or I would. Next. Um, the other thing is that kids are growing and developing, and so sometimes that pesticide exposure that occurs happens at a time when um, their development is very sensitive to that exposure. Um, we talked about chlorpyrifos, and um, that's a chemical that's been shown that if kids are exposed to it before they're born, while they're still inside their mom, it can have pretty far-reaching effects on their brain as they grow up. Um, reason number four, pesticides often contaminate food. Um, so um, this is uh, from the USDA pesticide data program. Every year they go out and they actually go to regular stores and buy produce and then prepare it the way you would prepare it to be eaten. And then they check it for pesticide residues. And um, what you can see is it's about 40% of what they tested. They found no pesticides. That's great. But on all the rest, they found at least one. And in about a third of the samples, um, there was more than one pesticide. So um, pesticides are, in fact, ubiquitous on our food. Um, so here's a couple of things that came out really high in um, this, the um, data from, it's actually data from 2013 was just released not too long ago. Um, celery, 95% of the celery samples had at least one pesticide. Um, when, I, when my kids were little, celery was the only vegetable that they would eat, and you had to put peanut butter on them to make it eat it. <laughs> but, um, so they ate a lot of celery. Um, fortunately, they all seemed to have survived. Most of that celery was organic, though, so it's good. Um, about half of applesauce baby food samples that USDA tested had at least one pesticide. That's kind of shocking to me. <laughs> um, uh, and just means, you know, things need to change. Next. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is pesticides and how they impact farmers and farm workers. Um, we, those of you who are on the tour saw um, and heard um, a lot about that today. Um, next. So I wanted to mention briefly, um, there's only a few studies that I think have done a really good job of documenting what pesticides do to farm workers. And the Chamaco study in California is, I think, one of the very best. Um, it's, um, it's a community-based study where um, academic researchers are working with the community to um, study these problems. And what they did was, um, it's now been about 10 years, I think, they um, recruited um, women who were pregnant, and during their pregnancy, they measured their exposure to pesticides, and um, then since then, have been looking at um, the children and what health effects occurred. And so um, what they found is that moms who had more exposure to insecticides um, uh, ended up having shorter pregnancies, um, newborns with poor reflexes, um, lower scores on IQ tests when the kids got a little bit older, higher risk of ADHD, and um, respiratory breathing problems. Um, that's a pretty long list. And it's also, you know, nobody should be in the position between having to choose between making a living and um, the health of their children. So. Um, there's another um, long-term study that's looked at farmers, um, and it's called the Agricultural Health, health Study, and it's um, looked at farmers in North Carolina and Iowa. 
and it's been going on for um, over 15 years now, and they found a wide variety of health effects that are linked to pesticide exposure in the farmers. A um, bunch of um, uh, important diseases. Um, one of the newest things is they've l been looking at prostate cancer, and in fact, there are several pesticides that um, farmers who are exposed to them are at a higher risk of particularly aggressive prostate cancer. Um, Max. Sorry? Who was doing the study? Um, that one. So the study um, is being done by the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And there's like dozens of researchers that are involved. Um, I'm going to just go back one second. Um, that um, website will, or that URL will get you to um, the information about the study. Next. OK, um, here's reason number six. Um, pesticides are um, not good for pets. Um, you know, many of us love pets. It's probably not as important as our kids or farmers or farm workers, but it's important. <laughs> um, so, um, no. uh, so um, one thing is that's um, common is just acute poisoning of pets caused by pesticides. Um, so the um, ASPCA, American Society of Prevention of Cruelty for Animals, has a um, poison control center just for pets. And they keep track of what, um, what, are the, what are the top problems. And actually, number one and number two, in case you're wondering, are um, actual medications that people take. And pets get into their family's medication, and that's not a good thing. But number three on the list is insecticides. And that would be um, either you know, insecticides that are used in the garden or the home, or it could be insecticides that are actually used on the pet um, for fleas or something like that. Um, rodenticides are number nine. So pesticides are really up there in terms of what poisons pets. Um, and I just. This is an old study, and I've had it in this presentation for a long time, but it's such an amazing study that I can't bring myself to take it out, even though <laughs> it's old. Um, so um, there was a veterinarian who was interested in um, cancer in um, pet dogs, and he said, you know what, I'm going to look at companion dogs. So these would be like seeing eye dogs for blind people. And because they are so important that they get the same kind of medical care that you and I get. And um, so there's good records about, you know, whether they get cancer. Um, and um, uh, in, in this particular case, I guess he was looking at terriers. Um, and what he found was that terriers who live um, in a house where the lawn is treated with lawn care pesticides, in particular 2,4-D, are at a higher risk of this particular type of cancer. Um, and you have to think that if the dog is getting cancer from the lawn, um, what about us, you know? <laughs> Next. Um, pesticides often contaminate water. and this, I think, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, especially um, in places where water is very precious. I'm from California, so um, we really think about water a lot. Um, next. So um, the US Department of Agriculture, um, similar to foods, um, tests drinking water every year. Um, and in the most recent study, they found 27 different pesticides in the drinking water samples um, from around the country. Um, the most common one will not surprise anybody here who's followed pesticide issues, but it's, of course, atrazine, just well known to have a great affinity for water. Um, next. 
um, so um, the U.S. Geological Survey has also done a lot of testing of um, streams and rivers around the country for um, pesticides. And in the, sort of the most recent batch of data, um, they found um, pesticides in 60 to 90 percent of the streams and rivers that they tested. The 60 percent, interestingly, is for um, streams and rivers in agricultural areas, and the 90 percent is streams in um, urban areas. So actually, the stuff that somebody puts on their lawn or whatever is really um, getting into our streams and rivers. Next. Um, so pesticides are hazardous to many, many um, kinds of living things. Um, I wanted to mention um, three that um, are just kind of sentinels for what's going on in the world. So fish, birds, and bees. Um, I, many of you, I think, have been following the bee issue, and I'm not going to go into detail about that because I'm not going into detail about anything, but also because we get to talk about it a lot tomorrow. Um, next. Um, so again, I'm going to do these the top three, the top herbicide, top insecticide, and top fungicide. So um, here we are at glyphosate. So um, some glyphosate or Roundup products um, are toxic to fish. Next. Um, chlorpyrifos has a pretty long list. Um, very toxic to many bird species. Very toxic to fish and other aquatic animals. Very toxic to bees. Next. And chlorothalonil, the fungicide, um, it um, causes problems for um, reproducing birds at pretty um, low doses and um, is also very highly toxic to fish. Um, so it's just important um, when you talk about the costs of pesticide use, I think a lot of times we forget to add in what it's doing to things that we all want to have here in the, in the world. Um, so I don't want to leave the subject of birds without just acknowledging Rachel Carson. Without her, we wouldn't be here, I don't think, at the 33rd National Pesticide Forum. And even though her work is now, you know, 60 years old or whatever, it's still amazingly true to this day. And if you haven't read Silent Spring in a long time, get it out. Read a few chapters or whatever. It's, it's amazing. Um, any of you who have worked on pesticide issues have heard something like, well, doesn't the government test pesticides? I know the government tests pesticides, and it says they're safe. Well, it's really important to remember that in almost all cases, that's not true. Pesticide testing is done by the companies that make and sell the pesticides. Um, in most arenas, this would be called a conflict of interest. <laughs> Next. So um, here are the big um, pesticide companies. They're the ones who make the money from um, selling pesticides. Next. And here are the same logos. Here's who tests the pesticides. So the next time somebody says, well, I only use stuff that the government has tested and has said OK, um, Tell them who actually tests the pesticides. Next. Um, and so I'm just going to end with one last thing. Um, there are a lot of secrets about pesticides. Um, most of us, like, let's just ask the question. When were pesticides last applied in this room? How much was applied and what was used? I'm guessing that we don't have any way to find out. But there's one other pesticide secret that um, I have found really compelling for the last, oh, almost as long as the pesticide forum has been happening. Um, and that's, they don't tell us what's in the pesticides. So if you look at the label of a pesticide, it will identify some of the ingredients, but not all of them. And, um, 
There's Beyond Pesticides has been working on this issue for a really, really long time. We aren't going to stop. It's, gonna, it's really hard and really difficult to make a change, but it's just something that has to change. If we're all exposed to pesticides, we need to know what it is we're being exposed to. So um, this is my parting thought. We don't need them. Let's um, switch to more sustainable ways of dealing with our pest problems. Thank you. Well, I've also known Evangelos a long time. Um, from his days in Washington, D.C. I think you got to D.C. a couple years before I did, but yeah. we, um, over the years, uh, he, Evangelos uh, shared with a lot of folks like me information like you're talking about, but the broader sort of policy problems that, uh, that plague the agency, and so wrote this book, this incredible book, Poison Spring, and which you're going to talk about tonight, which just came out in paperback. Um, so we welcome you and thank you for making the trip all the way from California. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Jay, and uh, thanks everybody for being here. I will be speaking to you about EPA and, and pesticides, of course. I mean, I could talk about solid waste or any of the other issues that EPA is dealing with, but pesticides really classifies and and uh, elaborates exactly what the government has failed to do for the last almost four years. My name is Evangelos Valianatos, and I started at the US EPA in 1979, and I got an early retirement in 2004. So I was there for 25 years. And I was there as a program analyst, working with economists, with toxicologists, with biologists, with everybody. And uh, when you are in a bureaucracy for so long, <clears throat> You get to know a lot of people, and uh, you find out what their challenges, their problems, their aspirations. And during that process, I, of course, they found out what I was also happy or unhappy about my work at EPA. And the scientists themselves, at lunchtime, they would bring to me files of their memoranda, their briefings, whatever they did. And within 20 years or less, I had almost a, a small library of the actual documents, the actual documents that EPA scientists themselves put together in order to convince their superiors to do certain things. And of course, I was personally at EPA from uh, Jimmy Carter down to George W. Bush. And of course, I was not exactly effective. Nobody or very few people ever listened to me. I was talking to scientists and trying to find alternatives to pesticides. And uh, clearly, that was not on the agenda, that is to replace pesticides with, an, with something less hazardous to the environment. So I decided eventually to write this book on, uh, as a form of kind of a, how to put it, say thanks for my service so that other people can discover what the government is doing. And to illustrate all that, I will start with a, two, three stories to make the point. Um, started in the mid-50s, uh, there was a tremendous need for laboratories to test animals in order for the chemicals or for the drugs to be tested on animals so that we can find out how hazardous those chemicals are so that the government can take certain precautions. And as part of that tradition, there were a lot of, there emerged a whole industry of laboratories to do the testing. And um, in 1976, one of my former colleagues by the name of Adrian Gross, he accidentally discovered that there was a vast corrupting, uh, corruption in a laboratory called Industrial Biotest Laboratory outside of Chicago, Illinois. And this laboratory was um, so large and so productive in its coming up with reports that uh, they were testing 40%, 40% of all the drugs and pesticides and other chemicals in this country. So Adrian Gross used to then work for the Federal Drug Administration. He and his uh, other auditor colleagues, they went there and they found a huge laboratory uh, that they were simply making things up out of thin air. If a study was 12, let's say 20 months, they did it in 10 months and then they made up the numbers <laughs> for the rest of the study. If a rat died or got cancer or anything, they replaced the rat with another alive, healthy rat and no problem. 
And indeed, some of the chemical companies, for instance, Monsanto, had its own man right in the laboratory supervising the corrupt practices to send a perfect report to the government so that their product would be approved. So this is a vast legacy of corruption that started in the mid-50s, and who knows? I cannot tell you whether the practices go on to this very day. But what I want to argue is that this vast corrupting tradition contaminated the the making and the acting and the theory all about science. Because all the scientists, like my colleague here, all these toxicologists, they were doing their work, they were reading the reports coming out of the industry, they were making recommendations, but nevertheless the decision had already been made about what these people were doing and they were just spending their time, so to speak. The number two point I want to make is, oh, no, let me stay on the, corrupt, uh, the corruption of the laboratories. What this forced EPA to do was to change itself. They didn't want to discover other laboratories doing corrupt uh, stuff in, in the laboratories. Because it wasn't just the IBT, which they sat down in 1983. The, the, the discovery was done in 1976, and it took all these years down to 1983 to shut down the laboratory. And I remember being at a meeting in the summer of 1980. This is in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they, we had received order from the White House. EPA was told not to bother with the types of Monsanto, for instance. Just say, focus on the laboratory alone and shut it down. And we eventually shut it down after a lengthy trial in Chicago. And the, the, the laboratory, Industrial Biotech, went out of business in 1983. Uh, so this this fact that EPA was worrying about finding other laboratories with this kind of practices, they forced EPA itself to make a transition, a transformation. What they did is, number one, they hire a company. They outsource their own responsibilities so that you had 100 toxicologists that were capable to examine the data by what you think they happened. They put a company, a for, I mean, a, 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 how to put it, a company to look at the data from the companies, and then the company would send reports to EPA on the basis of which EPA made its decisions. They didn't want to discover any trouble. And then, of course, the lab audit program began to diminish from five people to four people to three people. And then they were shutting down their own laboratories. He spoke about the laboratories. The EPA had its own laboratories. They began to shut them down. They would bring the scientists from the laboratories to Washington, D.C., and make them paper pushers. That's, that's what happened. And, uh, for instance, Adrian Gross, who discovered this laboratory, the corrupt practice in the laboratory, they, he was hired by EPA in 1979, the year I was hired, too. And uh, he and I were, in my office was right next to his, and we kept talking. He gave me everything he ever wrote. And what happened? This man discovered corruption within his own branch of toxicology. The toxicologists themselves, because they knew what was going on, Instead of spending days and days going through the data of the industry, they were going to the conclusion. They were taking the conclusion of the industry and they're making their own and put it as their own decision. This was known as cut and paste science. You understand how the corruption moves now. And then there's another, and then of course, uh, um, Adrian Gross, who discovered this small practice among his own colleagues, he ordered them to stop it and they took him out of the, his position. They gave him an office and a computer, and the man did nothing for 10 years, and he died in 1992. This is the price he paid for being an honest, good scientist. So there's another part now, part of the law now. This is part of how EPA defines, let's say, an active ingredient. You know, Carolyn spoke up about the three popular, the most popular herbicide, insecticide, the fungicide. Now, they call about something about active ingredient. Now, the active ingredient is supposed to be the, this stuff that kills the rat or whatever. But that chemical alone is never used by the farmers because they mix that chemical with a number of other chemicals. And it's that mixture that is actually used that causes the damage out in the environment. And it, of course, it gets into our food, it gets into our drinking water, and of course, in the air, the air we breathe. So when they go out in the field and they discover that chemical, that that mixture, they cannot really evaluate it because they are looking for their own chemical. They are looking for the active ingredient. And yet the active ingredient, as I said, is mixed up with a number of things that EPA calls inerts. Inert is like something like water. You know, it doesn't do any damage. 
<laughs> in fact, I'm, this is something like this, water. I'm drinking the water. So that this idea of the inert completely destroys any kind of credibility of scientific understanding of what we're dealing with. And that stuff, by the way, exists to this very day. So that if you buy something, a can of chemical, you have at least, say, active ingredient X, and then inerts, they decide active ingredient 5%, 95% inerts. Well, it happened that those inerts sometimes are more toxic than the active ingredient. So they would take, for instance, chemicals like DDT, which EPA banned in 1972, and use it in another combination, and they call it inert. Indeed, that really happened. And we had reports from New Mexico that the eagles were affected, the birds were affected, and so on. So those two things, the legacy of corruption and the screwing up of science by this idea of the inert versus the ingredient, is making it difficult to this very day to understand what we're dealing with, which is why, like she suggested, it's a good idea to get rid of all chemicals. We don't need pesticides to grow food, by the way. The, act, the very existence of organic farmers is very much a proof of what I'm just saying. We don't need these chemicals for, to grow food. And uh, Karen also suggested something about the effects on children and adults. Well, these are neurotoxins. Some of them are neurotoxins. In fact, some of them, like parathion, malathion, were directly connected to the chemicals the, the, the German Nazis had ready to, to use in World War II. In fact, they used them to kill six million uh, Jewish people. And those organophosphates, they are neurotoxins. These affect the brain, the nervous system. And they have been given new names, and, but they're still, they were used in, in agriculture. Let me give you just a little example about honeybees and these neurotoxins. Because I was there, they, I discovered through my colleagues, the history of what was used in EPA from 1976 down to the time I left. And it happened that in, 19, in the mid 70s, they took parathion and they put it in nylon microcapsules, about 50, 50 microns in diameter, and then they spray it on, let's say, corn and soybeans. So spring comes, the honeybee, I mean the honeybees, that's right, they go out to forage and they land on the flower, and they either would die on the spot or they would take it in their, in their hind legs and they would go to the hive and the whole hive would be dying. So the, in the memoranda itself, the ecologists were saying to their supervisors, look, this is what we know that's happening in Wyoming. This is what's going on in Illinois. Let's put a kind of a moratorium on this use of this parathion stuff and rethink about it. But instead, the political people in EPA, they said, no, we're going to expand the use of this chemical. And they expand it to other crops. And we come to the point in the last 10 years that we are replacing all those neurotoxins with another neurotoxin coming out of Germany known as neonicotinoids. And the stuff is just as deadly as the parathion to the honeybees. So that as we speak right now, the honeybees are almost on the verge of extinction in this country. Now you may say, what do we need the honeybees for? Honeybees have been with us for millennia. In this country right now, as we speak, they are necessary for pollinating 90 crops. So one third, people who know better than me, they figure that one third of what we eat comes because of the pollination of honeybees. And yet we're trying to, to, to get this beautiful insect out of to, 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 to destroy it. Why? 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 Why are we doing all that? So this is a moral and a very political and scientific question. Indeed, one of my colleagues, um, <laughs> Richard Lee, if you remember him, he discovered, he actually found the, the parathon in the gut of a queen honeybee. He painted it, he discovered it, and he wrote a report and instead of rewarding this man, they took him out of his lab, they brought him to headquarters, and he became a paper pusher. This is in the 90s. <clears throat> so th th these are the reasons why we really need to do something, and now we come to the question of EPA. Uh, because of the way I speak about EPA, you may think that I don't like EPA. That would be completely wrong. I love EPA, I think it's a wonderful institution, it's an institution that we absolutely need because we're us in an industrial society. 
will produce toxins not just in agriculture, but you have the coal fire plants, you have the electricity power plants working on, on gas, natural gas and so on. So there's tremendous pollution from the automobiles and all this. So somebody in some authority has to regulate all these things. But EPA is actually impotent, as was described to be, because of political corruption. The president appoints the administrator, but, in, but also he appoints the assistant administrators. And these guys, let's take the example of the Obama administration right now. There are several admin, assistant administrators. They know that Obama will be through in two years. So what do you think they're doing? When they deal with Monsanto and all sorts of big companies, which in theory they regulate, they communicate an urgency for their own future. And the companies also know about these guys. They are looking for a job. Yeah. For instance, uh, this, is, this is known, what is known as the revolving door. Um, the first administrator of EPA, who, as a Republican, he also banned DDT. Anyway, when he finished EPA, the second, uh, the second, the second he came, became an administrator twice. He was making about $76,000. When he got a job with a major waste company, he made a million dollars. So there's a tremendous kind of money push for this corruption. And then the people with the, the big money companies, they make big contributions to congressmen and senators and so on. And they also fund thousands of trips by EPA people to go to conferences to seminars, you name it. And during those meetings, this is where corruption takes place, invisibly. Uh, they meet you, you have a cocktail, and they, you exchange cards, and then they call you two weeks later, and say, hey, you remember me? My name is so and so on, and I have a petition to the EPA, would you be kind enough to see what is going on and let me know within two weeks? Uh, if you don't do it, then this person will call a congressman, and the congressman will call the assistant administrator, and the assistant administrator will call the division director of my division, and then he will talk to me and say, hey, Valianatos, what are you doing about this, for instance? So that's one way of corruption. The, the funding of the trips plus the political, the, the reality, the political reality of our economic system that is actually using tremendous amount of money for, for it to, to work. So my proposal is that if we need an EPA, if we want an EPA to actually serve us, we need to redesign and rethink EPA to isolate it from this political corruption. Make it the agency independent, as independent as the Supreme Court, or as, for instance, the Federal Reserve. The president will have a role to appoint somebody, but he would not appoint the assistant administrators. The assistant administrators ought to be appointed by the man who's going to run the agency, let's say for 10 years and no more. And then we should have by law, create a law so that there will be no lobbies ever coming to EPA. I'm telling you, every day there is one or two or more lobbies at EPA. Every day there's a meeting. I went to many of those meetings. And these guys come in their beautiful suits and they bring all these uh, <laughs> slide shows, flashy stuff. And they do that, then you have the EPA people going in the room and they behave like children listening to the professors rather than the other way around. They play this game very, very successfully. I would cut that off. And I used to argue, I would say, I was going to, I, I used to say this. If we're going to have this meeting with, say, the representatives of this X major company, why don't we invite also a couple of people that represent NRDC, Sierra Club, the Friends of the Earth, you name it so that at least they find out what we're doing. Say, so, no, 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 forget it. They keep the environmentalists out. And now, um, since from, let's say, from the time I started in Jimmy Carter down to now, it's becoming more and more difficult to get information about what they're doing. Because these people are very smart. They have known the game, and they like the game, they make a lot of money. Each new chemical makes $20, 20 million per year for 20 years. So, and then not, not only that, because of the money, they have created the whole idea, the whole industry of genetic engineering. Why do you think we have GM crops, crops today? It's because they want to perpetuate the life of the life of the Monsanto, of, the, of, that, of those chemicals. The very worst chemicals, the Roundup, that's now the, supposedly the most popular herbicide on Earth. 
And none of the stuff about being carcinogenic would actually work because they make too much money out of this. So the whole genetic engineering is another way of perpetuating the life of these chemicals. And of course, if you put that, and you put what I already said about the corrupting influence, then what chances does the organic farming have to survive in this country? Well, you have an organic piece of land right here that forbids you from using synthetic chemicals, but then you have next door a farmer who uses parathion-like uh, substances, and then there is a wind, you know, drift. The stuff moves. By the way, when you use a helicopter and you spray the stuff that falls to the ground, only less about less than 1% maybe will kill an insect or will kill a weed. The rest becomes volatile, becomes a gas, it gets into the air, and then moves around the globe. This is, this is what happened with the, with the toxaphine, for instance, why they banned toxaphine in, in the early 90s. They found toxaphine, that was the chemical that replaced DDT, they found toxaphine was contaminating everything was found in fish in the Great Lakes. They found it, in fact, in a little island in the Great Lakes, which has zero agriculture. So they found out that it moves by the air. It drops down and stays there. The fish absorb it, and you discover the chemical. For all these reasons, therefore, I suggest that we rethink of recreating EPA and then um, eat organic food. It seems to me that's really the, the, the way to go ahead. The more organic farmers, the more organic food we eat, the less we buy of this contaminated stuff. And uh, I, will, I will end up by saying that uh, it took me about 20 years to write this book, and I would hope that all of you <laughs> will get a copy of the book, and not only get a copy, get more than one copy, and give them to your friends. The idea is to spread the word. Why am I talking about myself now? I'm, I'm selling myself. It's not because of me, but because the book is the first opportunity, the first time ever that gives you a perfect picture of what the government actually does versus to what you think it does. If you don't have that knowledge, you cannot even ask a question. It's a very complex problem. It, it, it goes all the way to the 50s. So we're talking about somebody mentioned, yeah, you mentioned the Rachel Carson. Why did I have to have a need to write a book like this after Rachel Carson? Rachel Carson wrote her book in 1962. Of course, she wrote her book on the basis of, 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 a, of uh, credible scientific literature. I wrote this book on the basis of what people in the EPA itself said about these chemicals, which they did not dare to speak too loud because nobody actually pays attention to what they actually do. Because the decisions, as I said, have already been made and they don't listen to, to their own advisors. Despite the fact that the EPA is a fantastic organization that has all the scientific disciplines right there and they could do a fantastic job if only they are allowed to do their job. So I will end up by showing this, this slides. Where is the, because the, this slide simply, I will go very fast. The slides illustrate the dangers of actually using the crop. And this, this, I came across these pictures from the 80s. The only difference is now the machines have become larger and the danger has expanded. But it's, the process is pretty much the same. You can see how these guys, without any clothing, this is the mix them up and it, how they spray them, and it's just, uh, as you notice, the machines have become larger today, but they're not exactly much different. Uh, because, I mean, you remember the time that uh, they used DDT. They thought DDT was a golden bullet, there was no problem. And they had children going through dust of DDT. I mean, this is just fantastic. I mean, they, it's because of our affection to technology. We think we are a technological society, we are associate that uh, technological uh, business with modernity, with uh, scientific education, and we don't really ask a question, hey, what does the effect, what does it do to water? What does it do to the soil? After all, the soil is really the life that produces eventually corn and soybeans and wheat. And there's a fantastic professor at, uh, at the University of Purdue, I think he retired, Dan Huber, who is an expert microbiologist on the life of the soil. And he says too many, too much of that stuff, the Roundup, is killing the very, the very organisms which are responsible for the movement of nutrients from the soil to the, to the thin hair of the roots that eventually gives you the crop. So if you do that, then you eat stuff, but then the stuff is not nutrition. So there's a danger. In fact, I, in my book, I quote him. He sent a letter to the USDA Department of Agriculture, the secretary, only two years ago, 
He said to him, dear secretary, if this roundup business continues, will you actually threaten the destruction of the entire agricultural system of this country? Because of the connection between the nutrients and what we actually eat. And he, by the way, he spent 20 years as chemical warfare staff in the army, and then he became a professor of microbiology. Mm -hmm. So if anybody knows anything about that, it's this guy, not me. And yet the Secretary of Agriculture didn't even bother to respond to his letter. He had an underling who wrote to him a letter. He said, we do everything by science. We are a science-based organization. There, there you are. In that, that you, that's what you get. <clears throat> So we need to rethink about this. I mean, this is uh, totally unacceptable. Um, and you know, by the, by the way, these chemicals, in my humble opinion, what they do, sometimes they kill insects, sometimes they kill weeds, but for the most part, I think it's a political purpose. The, the purpose of these chemicals is to help the, sm the large farmers to remain large farmers and to become even larger. Because if you have 10,000 acres of land, you need an army of, of workers to actually do but then, instead of that, of course, you send a helicopter and sprays everything, kills everything, and you grow only one crop. You divide the animals from the land, you create the problems, and you actually create infestations. So who is making money out of that? The people who manufacture the stuff. Not you and I. And um, <clears throat> so this is, this is some of the, the effects, you know, the waste, the, the trust, the, the amount, the hazardous, the poisoning of the water, because they, wa they used water, of course, to do the, the mixing, and uh, the, the danger to the farmers themselves. She mentioned something about the farmers. In the early 90s, EPA was having internal correspondence, which I cite in the book, that in Iowa, the farmers were dying of cancer at twice the rate that, the, that, the, that any place else in the, in the country. This is in the early 90s. Imagine how many times higher they are dying today, all these years later. We talk about where cancer comes from. Some of you might have seen the documentary on cancer. It was called the Something About Disease. Six hours of documentary by PBS, and they had, out of six hours, only 15 minutes on prevention. The rest of the time was all about doctors cutting the breast of women and doing this and that and that. Not, nothing to do about this. They never mentioned the word or, uh, farming, organic farming, or pesticides once in six hours. This is what you get. This is the, the established tradition or the establishment wanted to promote its own business. The medical doctors not teaching their medical students about this for the most part. And of course, the rest of the people, they make a tremendous amount of money out of cancer. Cancer must be a huge business. It is a huge business. But then cancer comes out of the stuff. There's no doubt about that. Most of the, most of the fungicides, for instance, are carcinogens. Carcinogens means cancer-causing chemicals, and yet we allow them to be used. So here we are. <laughs> and this is it. And I thank you very much, and I'll be delighted to respond to your questions. Any question? Yes. In your book, everything that you just said right now, is that in your book? Yes, sir. I barely touched the surface on the book. Yes. I have a, I have a chapter on honeybees. I have a chapter on the corruption. Everything is very well documented, as I said. 20 years of collecting documents and writing this book. So everything that you said is in the book? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes? Yeah, uh, I, when I worked at the EPA, you know, I, I agree with the same things. I think it was worse at, at certain times during the Reagan and Bush era where they were, the lobbyists were coming in without any, there weren't any doors that, there weren't any doors that kept them out. They, now they have, at least they have gates, so there's a record of when they come in and out, supposedly. But uh, I'm wondering about the corruption of the, uh, the, the holiness. Trying to convince the uh, Park Service 
to even look at the possibility that glyphosate that they're using year after year to kill the same lesser celandine, this, this big buttercup invasive. They don't even agree to look that there might be something that's happened with the mycorrhiza, the good fungi in the soil, or, or the microbiology of it. Oh, they're saying all those are just in, vi in vitro studies. They don't mean anything. And they, so in this whole, I want you to address, and I'm sure you do in your book, I'm, I'm just starting it, about the, the whole um, crowning of IPM as this sort of high priest of uh, that IPM is going to solve everything and, and that, uh, you know, pesticides are just a tool in the IPM arsenal. And just address that, how that became so enshrined. Yeah, one of the... One of the one of the things I was doing because I was in the uh, when I started I joined a program they call it farm worker protection which was really a fraud frankly it never was to protect the farm workers but anyway I was there then I discovered they had a small unit they call it the IPM so I knew the men and the women in that unit or so I used to talk to them and it seems to me the people had they were well-meaning they wanted to actually move from hard chemicals to IPM so that they use less of them, but of course never, nobody paid attention to them. It was like lipstick. The IPM was a lipstick at EPA. They did not really mean to do what the IPM science was all about. And they faded away. They spent money, by the way. They did a wonderful job in the very beginning. They created a number of documents. And uh, there was a fantastic colleague, Charles Reese, that used to head that uh, unit, and they produced, as I said, wonderful documents that summarize the scientific literature about this and that and that. So to that degree, it was very useful, but from my personal experience, they never followed, they never listened to me, for instance, on alternatives. So they never listened to them to, on, on their recommendations. So it, it was just another, another lipstick service. <laughs> Regrettably, I mean, that's what you get when you have um, an agency that is besieged by people with tremendous amount of power. Uh, to do, to speak out, it's, it's hazardous, believe me. I mean, some people from EPA that, showed, that spoke, they went, they took EPA to court, but you never win, really. I mean, the pressure on you is tremendous. And if you have a family or children, you don't take things lightly. So you keep your mouth shut and you suffer rather than go out and do what you do. I spoke to many um, staff of congressional committees, privately, of course, not in public. And I would pass on all sorts of things. The documents I had, pass them on. They never followed, they never had hearings, for instance. Then they were the Democratic staff. I never spoke to a Republican. But they never took me seriously. It's just as if, as, as you suggested, it's like a religion. They think this is appropriate. And by the way, another, another institution which I blame for all this is the land-grant universities. The land-grant universities know far more than I ever have, have known about agriculture. And yet they abandon the land, the, the, their mission that is the mission of protecting and supporting and creating science on the benefit of the small farmer. They abandon that and they have gone, their mission was the grand vision of agribusiness. I taught for a year at the University of Maryland, and I was in a department with 40 full professors. Myself and another soil scientist were the only two people who ever used the word family farming, sustainable agriculture, and organic. The rest of the faculty refused to use even the terms. They, because to use the terms according to them was to, to immediately raise questions about what they were teaching. They had all these big plans about moving rivers and ecological this, ecological that, but they were, they were actually bidding, they do, they're doing the work of agribusiness. And they were bringing money from big corporations into the university. And this is what, in, in other words, we have to begin to think in a grand vision, not just to reform EPA, but to reform agriculture in general. We need to go back into sustainable, small-scale farming. The big farmers, as we have them today, they are very undemocratic. They spread the risk to you and me, they call those externalities, they kill the fish, they kill the birds, and they care less. As far as they are concerned, they can go to Brazil if something goes wrong here. Land is there. 
So we need to, go, to get away from that. We need to really recreate the institution of small-scale farming. And then, of course, pesticides become irrelevant in that, in that uh, setup. 